Expo presenting mobile education series powered by the Rad Company. We have a live webinar every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern on Facebook and YouTube. If you're joining us on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can never miss a session and get notifications of when we go live like now. So before we get started, I wanna give a huge thank you to the Rad Company for being our sponsor and let's take a moment to watch a video. All right. Well, as always, thanks again, guys. You're a huge help to make this happen. So today, I'm so excited to have the one and only Mike Phillips here, who's going to talk to us about the huge popular topic of boat detailing. So let's get you in here, Mike. There we go. Thank you so much for joining us. Great to see you, as always. Wish we were together you know, in Orlando, but missed you there. But glad we can talk virtually. Thank you, Sheldon, for having me on for this class. All right. So... Give us a little quick rundown of what are we going to learn today and what's your history with boat detailing? Okay, so um, what I'm going to show is um, a method of restoring severely oxidized boats via machine sanding. And I'll explain why. The reason why is is a, traditionally what most guys do is they use a, a rotary buffer or a rotary polish with a wool pad. And the process includes a, an aggressive compound. And then the other component is the physical aspect where the guy pushes hard against the side of a boat for hours. And um, I started out teaching classes using this system. And then I think it was sometime around 2009. And I, I could be wrong on the date, but I think that's when Merca Abalon was introduced. It, it actually was probably old, further back because I remember what's in the Joker truck with Merca Abalon. And that was 2006. But Merca Avalon is a sanding disc that lends itself very well to machine sanding oxidized gel coat. And the basic difference that I show is instead of taking and pushing a rotary buffer hard against the boat for hours, you can use virtually any orbital polisher, air, you know, pneumatic or electric, and then just hold that polisher lightly and let the sanding action do all the hard work for you. So that's kind of what the class entails. All right. And yeah. Make the machine do what it's made to do, right? Exactly. And in and, and the bigger picture is this. You get better results that last longer, and it's a lot easier on you. So, you know, there's actually a real method to the madness. Awesome. All right. So let me get this set up here. The way I got into boat detailing was um, I owned the same boat for 20 years. I bought it in 1981 when I was 21. I sold it 20 years later when I was 41. And uh, it was a full race drag boat. And um, probably over the length of the time I owned it, I probably machine sanded it at least three times. And that would have been to remove a lot of the scratches that you get from things like dogs walking across the bow, uh, girlfriends with flip flops with sand under them, things like that. And, um, and it was actually the only boat, I think I mentioned this to you, the only boat actually enjoyed buffing out. All the other boats I've worked on in my life, um, as cool as they are, they're just a lot of work. So. Awesome. All right. Well, I got the video to cooperate with us. So again, this is boat detailing with Mike Phillips. This is obviously pre-recorded, but Mike's going to talk us through. Uh, this was last week, you said, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, my my I teach a boat class here in Stewart. Uh, usually, it's once a year, just because of the logistics of getting the boats down here and setting the classroom up. It's it's a it's a lot of work, and uh, the boats that I bring in have to be very specific. They have to be dark in color. They have to be severely oxidized and, if possible, have mold and mildew in them. And um, I can't use a white boat because there's no visual impact when you take before, uh, get from before to after. I mean, you can see it in person, but it's really hard to capture on video or film. And even for the students, there's just not a dramatic impact. And I like my students to have a great experience when they take any of my classes. So, you know, the boats have to be very specific, dark color, extreme oxidation, mold and mildew, and they have to be large. Uh, this last class had 27 people in it, and that puts uh, basically 13 people on one boat and 14 people on the other boat. You know, that's like six or seven people or six or seven or eight people to a side. So I bring in big boats so everybody has plenty of room to work on. Nobody ever complains. I didn't get any hands-on time in any classes I teach. 
So, uh, but anyway, then before we taught that class, I, uh, Yancey and I just took a moment to take the uh, 27, uh, Conch 27 and create this video. So what you're seeing awesome. is the exact same thing we're going to show the students. Perfect. Well, so for those people that couldn't be there live with you, they can watch it online with us now. And if you're watching, make sure you ask your questions in the chat. Uh, we'll be able to see it and I'll relay them to Mike and he'll get them answered. So here we go. So I think we're going to first talk about what kind of tools you use, right? Okay, sure. Yeah, there we go. What supplies do you need? So Yancy yes, did this. I thought this was fairly creative how he did this. So those are the Merca Avalon sanding discs. Uh, they range from 1,000 to 4,000. A handheld light to inspect your work. That's a foam cutting pad. That happens to be the BNS uh, Eurotech. Uh, Mike Fubber towels. Those are uh, rag company glass towels, actually. A uh, foam interface. A uh, soapy water, clean, oh, clean water source. Uh, wool pad for the cutting step. That's a Rupes. I really like the Rupes pads. Uh, the prep spray, that's a panel wipe. This is a ceramic coating, so we're going to seal in the results of the ceramic. Um, a compound, a microfiber applicator pad to apply the ceramic coating. Rotary polisher, that's the Flex Cordless PE14. And um, pad spur, got to keep that pad clean. Masking tape, uh, that's to do things like protect. Um, a lot of boats have a boot stripe. It's like a big pinstripe across the bottom, as you see in the back of that boat. Just take things off. Also, anything. Uh, decorative, you know, a lot of boats have a uh, chrome, stainless steel, and anything where you're going to be sanding, you want to take that off because you don't want to uh, scuff it with your sanding disc. Right, right. Anything weird here that a detailer wouldn't normally have and they might have to go buy to get into boats? Or is this stuff that's normally in, like, your wheelhouse? This, no, oh, this is, uh, you know, maybe the sanding discs, you know. Um, you know, wet sanding is a really popular topic. But, but, you know, one of the things I'm always trying to teach people is when it comes to the, you know, in the car world, the factory clear coat's about three mils, uh, two mils thin. It's not even two mils thick, it's thin. And uh, a good way to understand that is to grab a post-it note or a piece of printer paper, hold it between your, your thumb and your finger. And when you feel how thin that post-it note is, then your brain can easily wrap around and go, okay, so my clear coat on my car is thinner than that. And because it's so thin, most of us should not be wet sanding by hand or machine factory finishes. In fact, most color sanding or wet sanding is done to custom paint jobs where the painters put more clear on. When it comes to boats, uh, the gel coat can range anywhere from 20 to 30 mils on average. So you have a lot more material there to work with. Uh, but besides the sanding discs, you know, uh, these are tools and, and products that most detailers have access to. Okay. <laughs> Rod Pusey says you're a uh, detail encyclopedia. <laughs> And uh, and for what it's worth, Auto Geek carries Merca Avalon sanding discs. So. <laughs> All right, so first you're going to mask everything off here. Like you said, yeah. normally you just do this for the trim or things you wouldn't want to damage inadvertently. But yeah, so why I'm taping this off though is um, this is what I call my test spot, and you know you don't need to tape off a section, but I'm going to capture this for my own purposes with the camera, and I just wanted a strong demarcation line showing before and after. Uh, but in the real world, yeah, if you're buffing in a boat, you don't waste your time taping off the section on the side, unless you really want to, you know, for marketing purposes. But um, you do want to be careful. There's a there's an article I wrote years ago called "The Line: Don't Buff on It," and that means the the tape line. If you sit there and sand and buff real hard on car paint or gel coat right where that line is, you'll leave a physical line in the side of that thing. So, uh, really, professionals should only be doing this kind of stuff for marketing reasons, and I'm doing it for that, and that's what. You're doing. Now that you see right there, I'm taking off the bootstripe there. And I put two layers of uh, tape on, and that's because, you know, the, the human muscles, the way they work, it's naturally easy to waver over where you're not supposed to go. And then here's something I do for this type of stuff, and also cars. I take a dry microfiber towel, and I'm really pushing that tape on hard because once I hit that with the sanding disc or a buffer, it's going to want to peel up. And once the tape peels up, there's there's really no putting it back. It's kind of game over because you got water and soap and stuff in there. But uh, and then I'm kind of anal retentive. You know, there's a there was a gap there and where, <laughs> you know, where I run it down. So I kind of pull back and push it all up and hammer down on it. Uh, but again, this is just I do a test spot on every single boat before my class just so I know what's going on before the class gets done. All right, so here you are actually going to see what you're dealing with. And one comment I'd say is this boat isn't as 
bad as I'd like, but I'll tell you, when someone offers to pull their boat out of the water and put it on a trailer and bring it down to my class, I take it. You know, I take it. And, uh, th but this actually had a lot of deep oxidation. It just didn't have chalky oxidation on the surface. Right. That might not show in the video as much, but you said it was still a pretty good challenge oh, to get it looking nice again. Yeah. Oh, this, yeah. We, we machine sand. This boat, we did 3,000 followed by 4,000. Always okay. use the least aggressive process to get the job done. Now, in this demo, I'm going to start with 1,000, go to 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, because I want to show the complete process in case somebody out there watching this comes across a boat that really is in a severely neglected condition. All right. On to the wet sand. This is a foam interface pad. And uh, this is important to have one of these. This is a 3M. Uh, and what this does is, you know, the side of a boat isn't perfectly flat. It has a curve to it. And all this is going to do is it's going to keep 100% of the uh, sandy disc surface engaged with the surface. But it also does something else. It smooths out that action at the polisher level, which in turn smooths it out for you holding it. And again, you know, in a class situation like mine, you got 27 people working on two boats. Usually you're by yourself or you have a buddy. Then spray the surface with some soapy water. And um, for this demonstration with 1,000, I'm going to go ahead and cut this pretty hard. So I'm going to make 14 section passes. And a section pass, and you'll see it here, is just, you know, each time you go to a section one time, that's one section that's one pass. right there, right. And one of the techniques I teach in all my classes, boat and car, is to count your section passes out loud. And uh, the reason I do that is because when you're doing something like this, it's real easy for the mind to wander and you'll forget on what pass you're on. And that's a big time waster because what most guys do is they don't count their section passes out, so they don't know where they're at, and so they forget where they're at, so they figure, well, I'll do a few more to make sure I did enough. Well, if you extrapolate that around an entire boat or an entire car, that's a lot of wasted time. And the purpose of a test spot is to dial in a process that works perfectly to one area. And when you do that and say you've counted out your section passes, it's important you duplicate that to the rest of the boat or the rest of the car, and you'll get the same results. But you can't duplicate it if you don't know where you're at, and that's why I teach counting your passes out loud. Do you even write it down when you really have it dialed in so you don't forget? No, or? no, no. It's just, it's, it's just because, say, you say, say I'm going to repeat this process over the rest of the boat. When I move to the next section, I'm going to overlap into the previous section, and I need to count those 14 section passes out. Otherwise, I'll start to think about what my wife told me to get to bring home from the store. <laughs> See, I'll forget what, where I was at. Then I'll go, oh, shit, I forgot. I better do four or five more section passes to make sure I did enough. See, if you don't count them out, you'll lose track and you'll, you'll end up wasting time. And you won't get, you know, consistent results. And right. as you run out of water, you know, of course, miss some on. Uh, keep that wet. Your sanding disc will last longer. And uh, the, the cutting action will be smoother. And the sanding marks will be more uniform. So while you're still working on this, is there a reason to use soapy water versus normal water? Yeah, and this, what the soapy water does is they soap makes it slippery, so it's a lubricant. You know, you want the sanding, sanding particles to cut, but you also don't want them to, um, you know, you want them to be able, the sanding just to be able to glide over the surface as it's cutting. And also the soapy water uh, enables or prevents the sanding just from loading up with the gel coat you're moving. So it'll cut cleaner and it'll cut longer. You'll get more uh, use out of the disc itself. Good no, question, by the way. <laughs> Same thing for uh, what's saying a car. A little soap in the water uh, helps for those reasons. Awesome. All right. So, again, if you're watching, make sure you ask Mike any questions. We have some downtime every now and then in the video. And, I mean, you can ask him what his favorite color is or <laughs> why he's wearing that great Marine 31 shirt. Or <laughs> One thing I'd point out is I'm showing the uh, cordless uh, CVs, so the cordless flex uh I forget the part number. I call it the CB, which stands for cordless beast. It's the cordless version of the beast. This is your sanding slurry. And then go ahead. I just take some of that soapy water spray on there and wipe it off. Um, get that off there. You don't want to start sanding again. And then in that, in that slurry, you've got gel coat. You possibly have sanding particles that came off the disc. You don't want to grind that into the boat. You want to work clean. Okay, so now I'm going to take, you see the blue oxidation yeah. come up there. So that's the thousand coming off. 2,000 going on. But the, the cool thing about the, the, the Sea Beast is uh, because it's gear driven, there's no, there's no stalling. And, um, and what I teach in my class is to use a gear driven uh, orbital polisher because it's the fastest way 
to machine sand a bow. Um, you can use a free spinning tool of any type if you want to, but here's what I teach in the class. It already takes a long time to sand down and buff out a bow. Why would I want to do it in ways that take even longer? So I'm a big proponent of the gear-driven orbital. In my last class, uh, we used uh, the Beast, the Sea Beast, the Super Beast, and the Rupes Mille. Those are all gear-driven orbitals. Yep, so lots of good options out there, obviously. So yeah. we used time to is money, so why, why would you want to take longer? Uh, yeah, why would you take longer? We used to sell the Makita PO 5000C, which is uh, the gear-driven from Makita. But, you know, you know, people ask me all the time, how come you could sell them? Because it didn't sell. It's you know, it just it set up and gathered dust. So, uh, but it would be another option. In gear-driven mode, it would make a great sander. In fact, I think in my original review for that tool, I machine sanded the car with it uh, using a uh, Trizac 5000, so something very safe on a custom paint job, not factory finish. Right. So how do you find the boat paint jobs hold up to all the detail work you've done? Uh, I mean, they, they hold up really well, but that's because we switched over to doing nothing but um, a ceramic coatings to seal the gel coat. Uh, and and the gel coat's different than paint. So like really high-end yachts are painted. They got what they call a marine specialty paint, like all grip. And uh, it truly is a very special paint. It's very expensive. And one of the reasons they paint large things like, you know, yachts with the marine paints is because it, it's too time consuming and cost. It's not cost effective to try to bring that boat in and have a bunch of detailers buff out the oxidation. So they put this marine specialty paint on there that is very corrosion resistant and oxidation resistant. And sometimes you can get up to 10 years. And the people that are at that income level, when that paint finally is like it's dead, it's ready to re. Uh, to do something instead of buffing it out, they just pay to have it repainted or trade it in on the new yacht. Yeah. Uh, but gel coats are very different. Gel coat is polyester resin with the pigment in it, and it's a it's a catalyzed resin. So there's a hardener that goes in there. And for that reason, that's you bring up a good question because now you've got a, pro a product that because of the pigment is mixed in with the resin, it creates a a, a resin that has a porosity to it, and uh, and that's why the oxidation is able to go deep into the gel coat, not just be on the surface of the gel coat like it would be with like a, uh, most car paints. Oh, okay. Um, looks like we do have a question from Chris. Um, we detail boats in Utah and deal with major hard water spotting and mineral buildup. Yeah, I'm in Vegas, I hear you there. What's the best way to remove and correct this? And what do you suggest as far as protection for older boats? Yeah, well, I have to just be honest and admit that I have never had to deal with that problem. The first thing I would do is I would look for um, a, a chemical alternative that you could um, apply to the surface that would dissolve that salt off. I, I know there's some products out there like that. Um, I would look at it that way. But once you get into anything that's uh, impacted onto the gel coat, you know, you got two options. You got the traditional uh, compound, you know, with either a wool pad and a rotary or maybe a microfiber pad on a VA or do as I'm showing here, sanding. I mean, if you're going to end up using a rotary buffer anyways um again you have two options when it comes to doing gel coat correction you can push hard with the rotary for hours or you could do say light sanding with say 4000 grit then come back with your wool pad and your rotary and quickly and easily buff out that sanding stretch pattern so you're doing the same thing you're just approaching a different way and as far as uh, sealing older boats again in the class that i teach since we're taking this down to pure gel coat uh, we're going to seal this up with a ceramic coating and we're seeing easily one year of protection before maybe you got to do something. It just depends on the boat store. There's a huge difference between a boat that's kept in the water all the time and a boat that's kept in a boat barn here in Florida because of the salt water and the sun. Uh, the salt water, believe it or not, is abrasive. Water is abrasive. You know, it carved out the Grand Canyon. Salt water is even more abrasive. You know, so a boat traveling through the water is being micro abraded by the salt water. And salt water is also very corrosive. I mean, look what it would do to a piece of steel that's unprecedented to cause rust. So it's a, it's a corrosion factor. Uh, so, um, but for you know, the older boats, I mean, once you get down to just a pure gel coat and you've removed all that dead oxidized gel coat, the, the ceramic coatings are, have a really good, strong attachment to it. So that, that's the way I go. I mean, your other options are synthetic sealant or some type of carnauba wax or other waxy type substance. And, you know, everybody knows that in a marine environment, you'd be lucky to get three months, maybe six months out of the sealant. But, again, it just depends on how the boat is stored. Is it in the water? Is it in a, 
Is it in a, um, a boat lift or is it out of the, uh, the sun and the weather in a boat barn or in your garage or alongside your house under cover? All those things have a huge factor into how long the results last from any correction job or if you have a brand new boat, how long it stays looking new. Well, that actually leads into our next question and you've kind of already answered it, but the question was how often does this have to be done? And obviously the answer is it very much varies, it varies. but it sounds like to be a good detailed business owner, you need to understand how long what you're doing is going to last so that you can proactively follow up with the owner and say, Hey, it's been two years you probably need me to fix your boat again or bring yeah, it. Yeah. You know, stay in communication with the boat owner and um, you know, it, it's real important. Anytime you pull a boat out of water to wash it, um, I recently went out on a buddy of mine's boat. We, we ceramic coated it. And when we got it to his house in the driveway, we washed it. At first, when I looked at the boat, it looked clean. It looked great. As soon as you made one, one pass, you know, with the wash mitt or the side of the hull, you could instantly see a bright, clean gel coat and then this film left by the water. And, you know, um, the, the, you know just a lot of stuff floating around the water, motor oil from other boats and just junk out there and get the film that deposits onto the surface. All right, so, so I'm here. I'm going to draw attention to the video again. It looks like uh, so you finished uh, with the 3000. Okay. So now you should be able to see the difference in the oh yeah before and after. Okay, so those are the sandy marks. Yeah, you know, this video isn't really showing this as well as you can see it in person. It might but, be able to, if you're okay with it, I could put this up for people to see on a bigger screen. After oh, I would rather do that and make me smaller. I've been working in the I'm, garage all day long. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is what oh, so it's your... for. Clean your pad. Um, there's four reasons to spur a pad. I, I went over in my class. With, uh, one is, is obviously to clean the pad. Can you pause it just for a second? Yeah. Okay. So there's four reasons to spur a pad, and one of them is uh, obviously to remove the uh, spent compound and remove gel coat off the pad. Uh, two is to kind of re to clean the fibers and fluff them up. The pad will buff better, it buff easier for you. Uh, two, if you don't clean the pad and you add fresh product, uh, you're going to pollute and dilute the fresh product with the old product. And then four, the residue. If you don't clean your pad and you just keep adding compound to a, a dirty pad. The residue you leave behind on the boat is harder, it's stickier, so it's harder to wipe off. That tires you out. So, and I, you know, I've used a screwdriver, I've used a wrench, I've used whatever's next to me to clean a pad when I didn't have a spur. But in the real world, a spur does a better job. Your pad lasts longer, and they're like ten bucks. So if you don't have a spur and you do a lot of wool pad work with the rotary, you get a spur. How many uses do you think you'd get out of a pad then if you clean it properly? Oh my gosh, you a wool pad uh, lasts you for decades. Okay. You know, it just depends. You know, like I've been in body shops where I would have guessed the pads were maybe ten years old or older. I mean, uh, the pads don't really wear like foam. Um, so, I mean, I got a story about a wool pad, but I don't want to embarrass the guy that owned it. Some much thing happened. But uh, wool pads are very durable. And you know, uh, that question came up in my class. You know, how many wool pads would it take to buff out one of these boats? One of the boats was a twenty-seven foot center console. The other was a twenty-six center console. And realistically, a person, say if I was by myself, I could buff out the entire outside of that hole with just one pad. Um, the, as long as I'm spurring it, keeping it clean. Maybe if you really wanted to go nuts, have two pads, one for one side. But pad saturation and a wet pad isn't really a problem with wool pads as long as you're just spurring them. If you're using a pad washer, to me, that's for something at the end of the day because you don't want to get the wool all wet. So. Okay. Let's keep on going here. So you just cleaned your pad. Yep. Okay. Now this is called uh, picking up your bead or strip of product using the 10 at 10 technique. And uh, Yancey put all the dialogue up there. But basically, you look at the top of your buffer like it's a clock, 12 o'clock. I went around. And there's there's 9 o'clock. There's 10 o'clock. What I'm going to do is I'm going to lay my pad down flat. I'm going to turn it on. And I'm going to run that strip in at the 10 o'clock mark. And um, then spread it around and start buffing. And uh, if you're really good, you do this and you don't throw anything anywhere. So, boom, there you go. <laughs> in a second, I'm going to show how to do the same thing, only I'm going to pick up the strip of product using the um, 10 at 4 technique. I'm going to pick it up going the opposite way, running that strip at the 4 o'clock mark if you're looking at a clock. And you'll, you'll see what I mean. Once you get really good at this, it's relative 
how you pick it up as long as you understand that when you run that strip into the pad you want to do it in a way that the pad's pulling the product into itself not throwing it all over yourself your neighbors or the boat everyone else yeah so you're doing eight passes here um while you're doing that we had another question any tips on the interior boat cleaning yeah but that's out of the scope of this video really i mean that's what i teach in the class and it's a lot of work more and more importantly is i'd rather stay on topic i, I can answer that later but if you look at how i'm holding this polisher i've taken that pad and i've went up on edge now um I, you know I, I meet guys all the time that say well mike that's not correct technique technique you should hold that pad flat against the surface um and i say you know god bless you if you want to do it that way but what's going to happen is that pad's going to yank you all over the place and tire you out what's easier is to go up on edge you have excellent control over it and just use that as your style and the next thing now uh, the next thing people will say well mike when you go up on edge because you have more pressure to a smaller foot from the pad you're going to put deeper hologram scratches into the surface and I would agree with you if I was using, see how I picked that up at the four o'clock mark there? Yeah. And so it becomes relative. You can go up, you can go down, and go side to side. Just all you got to do is start to figure out how that spinning pad is going to pull the product into the pad. But the, the thing about uh, deeper hologram scratches is what they technically are. Uh, some people call them swirls, but they're holograms. If you're using caveman compounds, rocks in a bottle, and you go up on edge, you're, yeah, you're going to push those abrasives into the gel coat. I'm using a compound that costs $60 a quart. It's an engineered abrasive. When you force them out and feel it, it feels like Jurgen's hand lotion. I'm not pushing any rocks or abrasives into the gel coat. The only thing putting that swirl in at that point is the fibers of the wool pad, and those will easily buff out when I switch over to a foam pad. So I've already heard all the arguments about all this. I've been doing this as long or longer than anybody, and I'm, I'm always happy to fill questions on it. But if I didn't feel confident in this process, I certainly wouldn't be teaching the class on it. Cool. Well, that was a nice little tip there. Um, someone did say, so back to the way you originally took the um, polish on, you did the two ways. Is there a technique you personally prefer? Um, well, I do the 10 at 10, 10 at 10 technique for most everything I do. But if you want to make it real easy, you don't want to worry about splattering it. Just take and put the, the compound in the very center part of the pad put the pad against there, bring it up to slow speed, spread it around, and then go up on it and start working it. Yeah, um, that's how I usually to, do it because I'm not an expert and I don't yeah, want it to fly the everywhere. Really to put it in the center, you know, look, look like the, the outer two inch ring on the center pad. If you put it on the outside and turn on it, it's going to fly out. So that's really the key there. And I think I just showed the hologram. Yeah, right? yeah, it's not the holograms there, so now you're going to yeah. take those and, out. And that's normal. That's what fiber pads do to a surface, whether it's car paint or gel coat. Okay, now this is a buff and shine uh, Eurotech foam cutting pad. It's very sharp. And uh, this is what I show in all my boat classes. Gel coat just does, at least hard gel coat, doesn't seem to like soft, gushy foam pads. Um, and I used to show the uh, the Rupes pad, but they, they discontinued their, their original style. And um, I haven't really liked the new style yet for this type of work because the poor, it just hasn't worked. So I switched over to this buff and shine which, by the way, is almost identical to the old Rupes style, and it works very good. Now I've switched over to the Flex Sea Beast, okay, and I just kind of showed you how I kept the pad in contact, but just tilted it and grabbed it so I didn't throw it everywhere. And after I got it spread out, now I'm going to push down. I'm probably pushing down about 10 pounds of pressure. I'm pushing on that thing. This is an 8-millimeter gear-driven tool, so there's no pad stalling. And then I'm just going to work that surface with the normal uh, protocol of eight good solid section pads. Crosshatch pattern, counting out my section passes so I don't forget where I'm at. Right, right. You know, when I'm out in the garage detailing cars, sometimes my coworkers come out to use the vending machine, and they don't know what I'm doing. They just hear me say something like four, and they know I'm buff, and then they hear five. And if they're there long enough, they hear me go to whatever I've dialed in, switch back over to one, and I'm sure <laughs> they think I'm crazy. But, uh, <laughs> There's I'm, Mike I'm talking being, to himself again. I'm being fast, and I'm being efficient is what I am. Yep. I like it. That's but, a great tip. Yeah, I taught this at Mobile Tech Expo uh, last year in every one of my classes. It's one of the tips at the very end of what the topic was. I go, here's a tip that will help you out. Count out your section passes. And when I meet guys in the detailing world that took my advice, they always say the same thing. You're right. It killed at least an hour out of my correction step. That's fantastic. So it looks like you did your eight passes there. Yep. 
I love these uh, orange glass towels by the rag company, by the way. I would uh, relabel them compound towels. They're stout, but they're still microfiber. And the, they have a loop, like a terry cloth. And the loop slices into that film, helps to break it up, make it easy to wipe off. Um, a really nice towel. I showed this in all my car detailing classes as a compound towel, too. Okay, remove the tape. This is just kind of to show everybody the difference. And also... Um, I'm going to use a panel okay. wipe here in a second, and for anybody that's ever done a lot of demonstration, if you don't remove the tape and you try to work inside that tape, you'll the, the compound will have mixed with some of the tape residue, and it actually creates a big smeary mess, which ruins your demonstration. Uh, guys that do a lot of demos, you know exactly what I'm talking about, so that's why I take that tape off there. Otherwise, you leave a smear with, oh, look at that, and I'm like, don't look at that, it's just a smear. <laughs> I, I no, think even, I mean, you can see the difference night and day. Yeah, you, I think I've been going to SEMA uh, 16 or 17 years on almost every every year what I do is I demonstrate on black paint. Okay, so here's the oxidized side, and then here's the polished side. Holograms are all gone. All yeah, gone. I know. Great. And again, some people say, well, Mike, going up on edge, you'll put deep holograms in. Not the great abrasive technology. Okay, so this is a panel wipe in the Marine 31 line. And we're just going to take and chemically strip this, and this kind of removes all the surface polishing oils. And usually what I show for uh, um, ceramic coatings is I show a, uh, a two-pass method. Uh, one I call the wet wipe, the second one I call the insurance wipe. So the first one I sprayed the panel wipe directly on the surface, real heavy, lots of solvent to pull the oils off. The next wipe, switch to a, a clean side of the towel, mist a little just at the towel, and give it an insurance wipe just to ensure... You know, any trace residues have been removed after the first initial wet pass. Okay, so here's the ceramic coating, microfiber applicator uh, block. And the only thing about this is because boats are, you know, so large, at least the kind I use in my classes, you really need to do a good job of priming the pad. Otherwise, you know, if you take a, if you only have a few drops on there, I mean, it might look on camera, but the dry parts of the microfiber will be pulling that off as you're wiping. So you need to dampen that side with your initial application and then your basic crosshatch pattern and you know there's no magic in my opinion to crosshatch all it is is it's a it's a it's a technique that anyone can use you can teach employees and it ensures uniform coverage over the entire area and is this uh ceramic coating any different than a ceramic coat you put on a car is it the same yeah, polymer? this one is actually specifically made for gel coat and uh, the difference between gel coat in most cars most cars are clear coats they're, um, the, the term is impermeable. They're not porous. Things can't go into them. Gel coats are porous. They're permeable. And uh, so it's a harder surface to get the coating to bond to and endure over time. Um, and that's really the key. Plus, the marine environment is really harsh. So what we recommend with this coating, this is a Marine 31 coating, is, you know, two, even three applications. And it's a very high solids um, coating so uh, you can fill the porosity and cover and coat the surface with less applications faster and it's actually brand new it launches I think in uh, April 13th so this was kind of a sneak peek oh cool. and another cool thing about it is you know the, the marketing directions say you can wait up to five minutes so you can go about six foot by six foot but um, I, I tend to just like to wait about a minute and then go ahead and give it a wipe you know any coating once it starts to flash, and you know, it's starting to get stickier to wipe off, and I don't want to fight myself. That's called a Mike Pennington nod right there, if anybody knows Mike Pennington. Every time he made a McGuire's video, it's always looking into the surface and nodding. So, <laughs> here I'll be about that. We call that the Mike Pennington nod. And that's kind of the, the grunt work right there. Well, there you go. Now you just have a whole lot more boat to do. Yeah, well... And that's why I like having my classes. I kind of do a little section to show me how to do it. And then I do this, clap my hands, and that means get to work. Anybody that's been in my class, they know all about the clap, what that means. That's get to work. So. <laughs> well, any other, um, well, obviously, if you're watching, we have quite a few uh, watchers right now. We, uh, we have some time for questions. So um, in the meantime, is there any r random tips you might not have thought of that you feel like that would just change someone's boat detail game or um you know um one thing since somebody asked me about interior detailing um 
I teach uh, any anytime I can use a machine to do something versus me, I uh, will use a machine. So I think back in 2009, I got an article that shows machine scrubbing tires with a quarter cable. Um, since then, I see everybody's out there machine scrubbing tires, but I think that was the first time it was shown. And of course, because that's a plug-in tool, that's a shock hazard. Uh, since Flex has introduced these cordless rotaries, um, I always tend to use the cordless rotary with about an inch and a half inch brush to machine scrub tires. And a couple years ago, I took that to the boat. I'm going to tie this in, cleaning non-skid. You know, uh, you can use a, a, a brush on a broom. You know, you can get down and scrub by hand. But man, nothing gets it as clean as uh, machine scrubbing with the rotary or even a, a gear driven sea beast, cordless beast. Again, you're trying to avoid the shock hazard by using cordless tools in a wet environment. And even though you're, the boat may be in your garage, you're going to be rinsing that boat out with water out in your driveway. You're going to be rinsing that boat out. That's a wet environment to drag an extension cord into. And then I also teach machine scrubbing all the vinyl um, with the mold remover or a vinyl cleaner in that same brush. I have dedicated brushes for the floor and for vinyl. But I tell you, there's there, the human the human cannot compete against the machine when it comes to getting non-skid and vinyl clean. So, you know, so, and the way I teach my boat classes is the first day we do the outside and that's kind of opposite how I would do it in the real world. And I explain that in the class, but one of the reasons I teach this is a, when I got people flying in from all around the country, or United States and other countries to take this boat class, I want them to have a great experience the first day and everybody's there to work on the outside of the boat. Work on the inside, it's necessary, but it's not exciting. Uh, the other reason why is because it is so physical. I can't have everybody waste, you know, wasting their muscle energy doing the inside of the boat, which is also physical, and have them be tired when it comes to doing the outside because uh, machine sanding is easy, but running that rotary buffer, pulling out your sanding marks and polishing, you know, that takes some muscle. And I need my guys and ladies. I have three ladies in this class because I need everybody fresh. So I do things kind of out of order in the boat class than I normally would. But besides that, to, to do a boat detail, I mean, the first step is washing. Start at the top, work your way down. Start at the bow, work your way back. Yeah, so uh, we just had a question come in saying, you said sand and polish the sections above the waterline, not done on the lower hull section, I assume. Uh, yeah, above the waterline. Yeah, no, okay. I, my, my class doesn't really get down to like where the, you know, the boat we were working on is the bottom painted. I mean, that's a specialty procedure. And it's kind of beyond the scope of what I teach. So it's from the water line to the rub rail. Water line and, up. Yeah. And then when we go to the inside of the boat, believe it or not, the, the top cap and all the inner uh, parts that are gel coat, they don't tend to seem to oxidize as bad as the parts that are you know exposed to the salt water or even fresh water. And um, we don't, I don't ever teach sanding that. For that, we just take wool pad, rotary buffer, compound, or... Wool pad, rotary buffer, one step, clean wax, or AIO. It just depends on if you want to do a ceramic coating or not. If you don't want to do a ceramic coating, there's no reason to compound the inside of a boat when a lot of times a real good quality uh, one step cleaner wax or one step a sealant or an AIO with a wool pad. I mean, you'd be amazed at what you can knock out with that. All right. So I think a last question here, and you've kind of hit on it, but I think it's probably one of the most important takeaways of the whole class. But can you talk about using your body weight rather than the arms? Yeah. You know, um, a couple of techniques I teach in my wet sanding classes with cars and boat is um, what I usually do is I'll have a guy, let's see if I can turn this way. I'll have a guy hold the rotary buffer out like this away from his body and I'll grab it and I'll say, don't let me move you. And I'll show that I can easily move that guy around. And I'll say, now bring that rotary in close. And then I'll try to say, now don't let me move you. And now, because he's got all his, his arms and his chest muscles to hold back, he's got leverage over that tool where he did it when it's extended. So you want to get close to the boat. And when you are using the rotary, um, there's a technique where you can rock back and forth from side to side. And basically, you can hold that rotary like in the same place with your body. And as you rock your leg, you move the rotary over the boat. And what that does is it, uh, it doesn't tax you, and it gives you such good control of the rotary. Like, you can really press hard if you want to. Now, going up and down, you can't do that because you can't rock. I mean, you could. I guess you could lift your body up. But there's a couple of different techniques I show for that. And when using a rotary buffer, I think you've got some pictures there if you want to pull those up. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll just kind of touch on it. So anybody that's wondering why sanding, this, this guy here in this white T-shirt, uh, he was one of my classes. And look how he's holding the rotary. I mean, he's just, 
he's not pushing on it at all. Look, his thumb is on the head. His hand should be up there shoving that thing into the bow. And uh, so I showed him the right way. Look at me now. I am pushing on the head of that, pushing it. I'm leaning into the bow. And, um, and you know, that's kind of how you use a rotary. Otherwise, you're, you're just not going to get the cutting action you need. And, um, and also, out of these two pictures, um, if a person, you know, didn't machine sand and buff like the guy with the white T-shirt, what happens is the oils and the solvents and the carrying agents and the compound as you're buffing, they soak into the gel coat and darken it, you know, or, or make it look richer. And it can fool you. It can look like you've removed the oxidation, but you haven't, you know. And so, and, and, and again, this guy in the white shirt, if you, if you start out like me over here pushing hard, really cutting hard, about the time you get about eight more feet down that boat, you're tired. And you start out doing good work, but it's only natural that your quality starts to drop off because you physically get tired. And that's, again, why I show machine sanding. Instead of pushing hard for hours, just hold the sander lightly against the surface. Let it do the work and work your way out to a high grit. Let your budget be the guide. I always show 4,000 because that's as high as Merca Aberlon goes. And then when you do go to buff out, that sand mark buffs out a lot easier than, say, finishing with 1,000, 2,000, or even 3,000. And it's sure as heck a lot easier than not sanding at all and trying to push that buffer all the way around the boat, you know, for hours, if not days. Yeah, not be able to do any other work for the next couple of days because you're so tired. <laughs> Good workout. All right. Well, Mike, thank you so much for coming on and walking us through the video and all these great tidbits you gave. I mean, there's some great advice for anyone watching to apply to boats, cars, anything. So um, where can we find you next? Are we going to see a mobile tech, I hope, and maybe some I more online so. classes? Um, well, I think my next class coming up with you, I'm going to teach uh, machine sanding on cars. And I have a 1963 Plymouth Fury. They just repainted the trunk lid. And I'm going to just show how to machine sand that using Trizac this time and then pull your sanding marks out and leave a scroll free finish. But I think on a, my next thing I'll be doing is I think I'll be over there in Kentucky at um, at the uh, Southern Detailers Conference. Okay. And then hopefully over in uh, Vegas at the next Mobile Tech Expo. You know? Awesome. Yeah, yeah I just booked my tickets to Kentucky, so I will see you there. I can't wait. Let's hope, uh, let's hope we continue to have the success we're having with this uh, pandemic that's been taking place. Yep, yep. All right. Well, again, thank you very much. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you so much, Sheldon. All right, everyone. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, thanks again to Mike Phillips. That was fantastic. Um, thanks again to the Rag Company for sponsoring this. We also have our supporting sponsors of G Technique, Coach Shimi, and PNS Detail. Make sure you tune in next week. We have a special one from Marshall Hill talking about ceramic coating and how you can sell more if you market it correctly. So again, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And again, I'm Sheldon Kay, Mobile Tech Expo Showman.